Hey friends, welcome back to the third installment of the Maranatha Global Bible Study. I trust that you're all uh, enjoying the study so far. Um, so we're now in the third session. We looked at in the first session, we looked at the first portion of Daniel chapter 7, and this concerns these four beasts, these four monsters that, as we discussed, represent four historical Gentile pagan heathen empires that are adversarial to Israel and to God's people. Okay, and then in the second section, the scene shifts to the heavenly courtroom, the heavenly throne room of God, the divine council. And there, the Ancient of Days and this figure called the Son of Man who comes on the clouds of heaven, these two equally divine beings, these two beings who are equally uh, Yehovah or Yahweh, however you want to say it, but one is in the form uh, like, like a Son of Man. And of course, the Ancient of Days is actually portrayed in anthropomorphic form as well. But this represents from the language that Christians would say this is the Father and the Son. Okay, and then the court sits, books are opened, and ultimately judgment is passed against the fourth beast, this fourth pagan uh, empire, as well as its leader, which is called the Little Horn, which is the Antichrist. And judgment is passed against the beast, the Antichrist, and instead uh, the Son of Man and his saints, his holy ones, are given a kingdom that will never pass away. And that really is, as we said last week, the heart of the gospel. Now in part three, we're actually gonna to turn to the interpretation. Again, as is so common uh, throughout the scriptures, you have a dream, you have a vision, a revelation, highly symbolic, difficult to interpret. That's exactly what happens here. The Lord provides an interpreting angel or holy one or someone that explains it so that we're not just left completely in the dark, not always, Sometimes the Lord does leave some mysteries, but for the most part, he either provides an interpreting angel or there are clear Old Testament references that we can look back to so as to understand the vision. Either there's clear Old Testament precedent or if there's not, an angel shows up and explains what it means. Sometimes there's both. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna jump into part three here, but before we do, it's really important. I actually wanna sort of finish up and sort of wrap up uh, last week's discussion concerning the scene of the heavenly throne room because there's a really important issue here that we didn't get to, and I think it's important that we do touch on it. So within um, the world of Christian theology, again, Christian the theologians, they debate the, the meaning of this, this imagery of the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds. Again, so in verse 13, you know, previously we had the Ancient of Days, um, his hair is like wool, his raiment is bright like the snow and this sort of thing. But then in verse 13, this is important to, uh, to read it, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, he was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. It's the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel of the kingdom, the one like the Son of Man, the, the Son of Man, the term that Jesus used to refer to himself more than any other term throughout the New Testament. That is the one that the glory and the dominion and the kingdom will be given to and to his people to the people of the Most High, as he's called. Okay, so that's the heart of the gospel, the coming restoration of all things, the end of this current wicked system of oppression against Israel and against uh, Christians as well, those that have uh, joined themselves to the God of Israel. Okay, so that's the good news. That's, this really is the heart of the good news right here. Okay, now theologians debate the issue here, the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds. Because throughout the New Testament, this is one of the most consistently used uh, motifs or themes uh, or, or even just expressions or phrases as it relates to the return of Jesus. Now, Christians most often will think of Jesus as coming back from heaven in the clouds. So he comes from up and he comes down. He went up and now he comes back down, right? But here it just says the Son of Man was coming on the clouds and he's led before the Ancient of Days. And so inevitably what happens is those theologians that have more of a, um, a realized perspective, they believe that at the cross 
and the resurrection and ascension, that really the kingdom is now. The kingdom has been established. So they would actually view this as historical. They would say this is uh, an image of Jesus after he ascended to heaven. He went up to heaven and then he was led before the Ancient of Days. And then you even have some theologians that go so far as to say Jesus is not literally coming back in the clouds. There's actually a lot of theologians that will say this. And it's so important that we just take a minute to recognize that that is bogus, it's unbiblical, it doesn't, it doesn't align with the scriptures, and yet these guys that say it, they're very articulate, intelligent, highly educated scholars. And so if you stick around long enough, you listen to enough sermons and debates and this sort of thing, you'll hear this. And it's important that we inoculate ourselves from this uh, brazenly false teaching. So I want to read just a, a couple statements. Um, I'm going to read some quotes from a man named N.T. Wright. Uh, again, I bring up his name a lot because he's such a popular um, teacher, um, such a popular author. Some, again, consider him to be the world's leading New Testament scholar. Again, as I've said before, very engaging guy, brilliant guy, has a lot of really excellent things to say. He's done some great things concerning historical scholarship, the historical Jesus against these real liberals. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to the return of Jesus, you just smack your head and you go, oy vey. Uh, it's just craziness um, how detached this is from the biblical testimony. Okay, so um, first statement. He says, um, after listening to Jesus' Olivet Discourse, the disciples, okay, so he's referring to the disciples specifically after they listened to the Jesus' Sermon on the End Times, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. He says, they had no reason, quote, they had no reason either in their own background or in a single thing that Jesus had said up until then, at that point, for it to even occur to them that the true story of the world or of Israel or of Jesus himself might include Jesus or anything else floating down to earth on a cloud. He says this would have been a foreign concept to the disciples. Nothing that Jesus had ever said, nothing in their background would have ever led them to believe that Jesus would come back on the clouds. Okay, That's a pretty strong statement. And he actually, he, he, he calls it, um, in another quote, he calls it a monstrosity that's embraced either by fundamentalists or by critical scholars. He goes, no, like any first century Jew would never have recognized something like this. I mean, very again, very uh, dogmatic, adamant, adamant language. A couple more statements. He says, nobody supposes that Paul imagined Jesus would make his appearance flying downward on a cloud. Like Paul never had that type of thing in mind. Paul never makes any statement uh, supposing such a thing. Um, and again, he says, no interpreter ought to imagine that the Son of Man, again, now here it's really hitting on Daniel chapter 7, can be interpreted literally. No one ought to imagine that as a human figure floating on a cloud. The image speaks clearly to anyone with ears attuned to the first century of the vindication of the true Israel over her enemies. Now, again, if you've been listening to me at all, um, especially the past few weeks, you know that I agree. Yes, the coming of the Son of Man is the victory um, of Israel over her enemies. Now, notice he says true Israel, as if there's a fake Israel and a real Israel. Now, there are many within Israel that are not true, right, because they don't have faith. A true Jew is, is someone whose praise comes from God because they deserve it, i.e. they're people of faith. So it's not just enough to be a bloodline descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One also has to be of the faith of Abraham, which is to say they have faith in God and in his Messiah, okay? So I agree with that, but the reason that he says true Israel is because within N.T. Wright's narrative, the coming of the Son of Man is actually an image or it's a motif or a phrase that they would have understood, this is what he would say in the first century, they would have understood it as his, him coming back to judge fake Israel, i.e. the Pharisee class, the ruling aristocracy. They were judged, the old system of Judaism, the temple, even the kingdom itself, the very nation of Israel was judged permanently and forever, and then it was transferred to the new and the true Israel, which are believers, and they escaped out of it. Okay, so for him, he flips the whole narrative on its head. It's not outward Gentiles, it's not heathen invaders that are judged, rather it is Israel itself that is judged. 
interestingly enough, by the heathens. Okay, so again, just flips the whole narrative upside down. Now, it's important that we understand the biblical background for this idea that Jesus, the apostles, and the historical Christian church have always understood that Jesus will come back in the clouds. Where does it come from? What's the genesis? What's the foundation for this idea? Well, it begins with Deuteronomy 33. Okay, so this is um, it's the blessing of Moses is what it's called. This is actually the last words of Moses before he died, and he blessed the 12 tribes of Israel. But before he did, he gave a prophecy, and it uses the language of the Exodus. It uses the language of the theophany at Sinai. God came down from heaven in the clouds, in the thick storm clouds, on the mountain in fire with blasting of trumpets with a mighty earthquake. Okay, so the New Testament, listen, we're not going to get into it in great detail, but the New Testament concept of Jesus coming back in the clouds, in thick storm clouds, by the way, not flight, white, fluffy, um, cumulus clouds as we you know, see in popular paintings and this type of thing. No, in thick rain clouds, storm clouds, the tempest, he comes back in the clouds in blazing fire. A sword comes out of his mouth to execute vengeance against his enemies. He comes back with the blasting of trumpets, with a mighty earthquake. All of the imagery of Sinai is transferred to the ultimate theophany, the return of Jesus from heaven. But the foundation for that idea and all of the passages that support it throughout the Old and New Testament begin with Deuteronomy 33. So it says, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai. Now, the, the word came there, the verb, is in the prophetic perfect tense, which is to say it can just as easily and legitimately be translated as is coming or will come. And it's, it's translated based on the context. So now translators, they look at this and they go, oh, this is referring to Sinai. It's referring to the theophany at Sinai. It's referring to history. So they always translate it as past tense. But it can just as legitimately read future tense, and I believe it should be. I believe this is a prophetic picture of the future. Because at Sinai, God didn't literally come down in the form of a man. He didn't come back in anthropomorphic form like a son of man. And that's exactly how he's portrayed here. Now again, a lot of scholars will just be like, well, the Bible's just using dramatized, flamboyant language. We know God didn't literally come down in the form of a man back in history, but that's what it's referring to. I go, no, guys, the New Testament, the New Testament interprets Old Testament texts that have God, that have Yahweh, God Almighty, coming from heaven in the form of a man to execute vengeance against his enemies, to give rewards and save the righteous. The New Testament always interprets those passages as referring to the return of Jesus. And Deuteronomy 33 is the foundation. So it says, uh, he blessed the people of Israel before his death. The Lord will come from Sinai. So he's coming up from the region of Sinai. And he will dawn on them from Seir, the southern regions of the deserts of Jordan and Saudi Arabia. He will dawn on us from Mount Paran. He, he will shine forth from Mount Paran. He will come from the midst of 10,000 of his holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the language and the themes that are in that. But then at the end of the prophecy, and we looked at this, uh, I believe we looked at it last week, there is none like the God of Jeshurun, none like the God of Israel. This is verse 26, who rides across the heavens to help you on the clouds in his majesty. So this is the first time that you have this language of God coming on the clouds to save his people Israel. And then finally, verse 29, happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. This is the first time the language of the, of the Lord being a sword appears. Your enemies shall come fawning to you, and you shall tread upon their backs. You will crush them down like under your feet, right? And so this is ultimately the language of the crushing one of Genesis 3.15, the Messiah. When he comes back, he will crush Satan and the skull of Satan as well as the followers of Satan, the seed line of Satan, and his people will participate and they will tread on the backs of their enemies. So look at this. Look at some of the themes that are 
uh, in here in Deuteronomy 33. You have the, the language, the theme of God coming. He will come. Come from where? From heaven, right? That's where he came uh, during the Exodus. He will come with myriads of his holy ones, thousands upon thousands of his angels. He will specifically come on the clouds, again, from heaven. He will be shining like the sun. This is where you get the language throughout the New Testament of Jesus coming in the glory of his Father. And it uses the language and the imagery of a rays shining forth from where he is up toward Israel. He comes back to save his people as the divine warrior and as a sword to strike down his enemies. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. You've got about 10 themes or motifs in Deuteronomy 33, which are universally then applied throughout the New Testament by Jesus, by Peter, by Paul, by John in the book of Revelation, and it's applied to the return of Jesus. Okay, And then that Deuteronomy 33 passage is expanded upon throughout the Old Testament. So you have passages like Isaiah 63, who is this marching up, again, from that same region with his robe soaked in blood. And he goes, it is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And his robes are soaked in blood because he's been stomping his enemies like grapes because the day of his vengeance and the year of his redemption has come. Clearly puts it in the context of the time of redemption. The divine warrior marching up from the region of Sinai toward Jerusalem. And this is a picture of the return of Jesus. Now look at this. Isaiah 40. I, there's so many passages that then expand upon that theme. Again, Isaiah 63, Isaiah 40, verses 4 through 5, and then skipping forward to verse 10. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. Let the rough ground become a plain, the rugged terrain a broad valley. So it's it's basically saying, prepare a road for the king. You know, roll out the red carpet, as we would say in in uh, modern times, the rugged terrain of Broad Valley, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. There it is, the glory, the radiant, the shining forth of the Lord will be revealed. Jesus, the Son of Man, is the glory of God in the flesh that we can witness with our eyeballs. We can see he comes. It's not just a concept. All flesh will see it together. Repeatedly emphasizes that throughout the scriptures. Your eyes will see him. Again, this is not something to be interpreted through an allegorical, as N.T. Wright says, no one would ever suppose that he will literally come back. That's a monstrosity. Isaiah said, all flesh will see it, the glory of the Lord. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Behold, the Lord will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. His arm, this is a reference to Jesus. It is the, it's as if God reaches down from heaven i.e. the incarnation. In the Messiah, he reaches down and he will rule for him. Jesus is the arm of the Lord. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, right? Isaiah 53. Behold, his reward is with him it's to save the righteous, to reward the righteous. His recompense goes before him. Judgment for the wicked, rewards for the righteous. Salvation and rewards for the righteous, judgment for the wicked. Again, multiple themes repeated here in Isaiah 40 that come ultimately from Deuteronomy 33. Isaiah 66, 15 through 16, for behold, the Lord will come in fire. What does it say in Revelation, right? Revelation 19, the ultimate final capstone, this image of Jesus returning from heaven in blazing fire, the armies of heaven with him, the sword comes out of his mouth. Now look at this, and his chariots, he will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind. Now in last week's uh, session, we looked at the fact that in Daniel 7, God's throne has wheels. And again, we saw in Ezekiel that the, the, um, the throne of God is a chariot throne. And it actually portrays the Lord, Yahweh, coming back from heaven on his throne. And sometimes, interestingly, there's, um, it'll, it'll go back and forth between the language of a horse or a chariot. It, and it uses both interchangeably. So that's kind of a, an interesting uh, little side note. And what's he coming back for? To, to render his anger with fury, again, against the wicked. Rebuke with his flames of fire, for the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh. Again, the sword going back to Deuteronomy 33, and those slain by the Lord will be many. Okay, so then Jesus, Matthew 16, verse 27 the very first reference to his own return in the entire New Testament, out of the words of Jesus himself, again, 
Remember the words of N.T. Wright, the disciples had no reason ever to suppose that he would come back on the clouds. Jesus said, for the Son of Man, the one in Daniel 7, right? Bar and Asha. He, he used the term bar and Asha, and we know that. That's the only time it's ever used in the Bible. He used the Aramaic. Why? Because when he said it, they wanted to kill him. They said it's blasphemy. Again, if he just said son of man, ben Adam, in Hebrew, they would have had no problem because Daniel's called a ben Adam, Ezekiel is called a son of man, but not the bar and Asha. The bar and Asha is the most high. The bar and Asha, the one in Daniel 7, the son of man, that Jesus referred to himself as, he is divine, he is Yahweh. That is why the religious authorities of his day wanted to kill him when he said that. In fact, they did. Same thing with Stephen. Stephen was martyred because he referred to Jesus as the Bar Anasha. In Aramaic, he is the one from Daniel 7. So Jesus said, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father. Deuteronomy 33, the language of the glory of God. He is the one that anyone who was Old Testament literate, they understood this wealth of prophecies that came before the New Testament that talked about God coming. Really what you had throughout the Old Testament, you have all of these promises of the coming one, of the Messiah, of the son of David. He's going to come, right? But then you have all, and this is, this is critical because this is what Daniel 7 does. You have all of these classic messianic prophecies of the coming one, the crushing one, Ezekiel, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 3.15, the son of David, 2 Samuel 7, um, Psalm 2, Psalm 72, on and on and on, Psalm 110, right? The son of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool, until I crush your enemies under your feet. So there was this expectation of the Messiah, the coming one, the anointed one, the king of Israel. But then you also had all these promises that God's going to come back from heaven, reflective of what he did at Sinai. He's going to come back and save you. It is in Daniel 7 that these two seemingly contradictory themes, because on one hand, the, the coming one, the crushing one, the son of David, he is a seed of Eve, he's a seed of the woman, he's a human, he's a seed of Abraham, he's a seed of David. One will come forth from you. We know he's human, right? The promised one is human. On the other hand, you have all of these promises of Yahweh, God Almighty, Yahweh coming back from heaven. What, what Daniel 7 in this whole, in verse 13, the son of man, what this prophecy does is it suddenly reveals that the two the Genesis 3.15, 2 Samuel 7, the son of David, and the coming of Yahweh, they are one in the same. They are one in the same. Yahweh is coming back like a son of man in the clouds. The son of David is coming back from heaven. That's, that's Old Testament. You don't need to look at a single New Testament verse to have that concept. Daniel 7 combines the imagery and all of the prophecies of the coming of God, the coming of Yahweh, with the promised coming one, the crushing one, the son of David, the son of Abraham, uh, the, the son of uh, Eve, right? It combines those things. So this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Again, Matthew 16, 27, the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels, Deuteronomy 33, and then he will repay every man according to his deeds. Again, Isaiah 66, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 63. He is, Jesus is saying, I'm going to come back, and he uses the two motifs to save the righteous and to execute judgment against the wicked. Every verse that you point to in the Old Testament that says, it says Yahweh is coming back to execute judgment against the wicked to give rewards to the righteous. Jesus applies pa Old Testament passages about Yahweh God Almighty coming to save his people. He applies it to himself. And it's the term son of man that is the glue that holds all these things together. All right? This is, this is not some esoteric, fundamentalist, you know, crazy talk. This is consistent old biblical imagery. Any first century Jew that understood the scriptures would have understood these things, and they did understand these things, and that is exactly why Jesus was ultimately crucified. It's ultimately why he was killed, because of blasphemy, because he called himself the Son of Man, and he had been preaching these things. Let's look at another one, just Matthew 24. Again, the Olivet Discourse. The discourse that N.T. Wright said, after the disciples listened to him, they had no reason to believe 
that Jesus ever said he was coming back. He says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. He's referring to Zechariah 12 through 14. They will look upon the one they have pierced, and then all the tribes of Israel will mourn when they look upon the one they've pierced, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great glory. They will see him coming. There's no other way to understand these things. Every eye will see him. That's literal. That's intended to be understood in very concrete, physical, earthy terms, right? Again, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then, after he comes in glory, then he will sit on his glorious throne. What throne? The throne of his father David. Where? On Mount Zion in Jerusalem, right? So Jesus consistently referred Paul... Peter, John, they all understood this, okay? So then finally, Acts 1, and this really, this just, I mean, talk about driving a stake in the claim that any first century Jew would have understood this in any way or differently. Acts 1, 9 through 11, uh, after Jesus had said these things, he was lifted up, okay? So he's with them. He's in his glorified, resurrected body. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God. He was lifted up while they were looking on with their eyeballs. You know, he's physically present with them, and a cloud received them, him, out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently at the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing, i.e. angels, stood beside them. And they're like, hey, <laughs> it's just suddenly there's a couple angels standing there. And they said, men of Galilee, rednecks, okay? Get the Galileans of the rednecks. Rednecks! Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you just watched him go into heaven. There is no way that we can embrace historical Christian Christianity, historical Christian confession. Because again, even in like the Nicene Creed, it says, you know, the historical church has always confessed, we believe Jesus will come again. Well, it's in the context of the scriptures. He's going to come back in the same way that they saw him go, in the clouds, literally. Okay, so there's no way to get around this. Don't listen. I don't care how brilliant, how educated, how popular any one of these teachers are. And there are many, many more besides N.T. Wright, and I'm not picking on N.T. Wright, but it's important that we understand that there is clear, overwhelming biblical evidence that Jesus is coming back in the clouds exactly as he went up, literally, physically, that people, we will see him with our eyes. And of course, Paul says when he comes back, we will be revealed with him, right? We'll come back with him. We'll be caught up in the twinkling of an eye, um, and we will be with him. Okay. So now I know I said we have to finish up last week, but that's so important that we touched on that because uh, there's a lot of confusion. And they'll always point to Daniel 7 and they'll be like, well, yeah, Jesus isn't coming back in the clouds. He's going up. You know, that doesn't matter. All Daniel 7 is saying is that the Son of Man is divine. And it just portrays a scene. It could have been when he ascended to heaven or it could be any time. There's really no timing context at all. Ultimately, really, to be honest with you, the timing of it is the end times because it's in the context of the beast, the Antichrist being judged. In other words, it's future. Uh, I mean, the ultimate context, unless it's spanning a broad period of time, you have to say that it's yet future. Again, the realized guys, the amillennial preterists, partial preterists, they're going to want to all put it in the past. But the judgment of the beast and the little horn is yet future. The judgment of the Antichrist and the coming of the Son of Man is yet future. He has not yet come back in glory, and all eyes see him in blazing fire with all of his angels. That has not happened yet. He is not yet sitting, thus, uh, on the seat of David. He is at the right hand of God, as it says in Hebrews, waiting until the time comes for him to make his enemies his footstool. And all of creation is groaning. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is groaning within us. And Jesus himself is groaning and waiting. And we should also be groaning. That's what recovering the Maranatha cry is all about. That is, that's what recovering, that's what recovering the come Lord Jesus cry of the early church is all about. And that's what really ultimately much of these studies are about, is getting back to the heart of the gospel, getting back to the cry of God himself in all creation. Okay, now, Daniel 7, 15 through 28. 
<clears throat> As for me, beginning in verse 15, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Like, so he just had all these amazing visions. And I just love this. It's so funny. So I approached one of those that was standing there. You know, he just walks up to an angel. He's like, what in the world did that all just mean? And he be, I began uh, asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me. <laughs> you know, he's in a dream vision, and he just walks over to an angel. He says, can you explain to me what this all means? And then the angel tells him. And he made known to me the interpretation of these things. And this is what he says. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings. So notice how we would say, well, they're kingdoms, because there are referred to kingdoms. But they're kings, kings, kingdoms. There is a telescoping dimension. Don't get caught up on saying, well, is it the king or the kingdom? The scripture sort of just zooms in and out. Don't get too rigid in saying, well, the, it can't be the Antichrist. Can't, you know, it has to be the kingdom and not the individual. And people get caught up on saying, well, are we talking about the Antichrist or are we talking about the kingdom? And I go, the king, kingdom, emperor, emperor, empire, emperor, they're pretty much... Uh, interchangeable in a lot of ways. Sometimes the scriptures focus more on the empire. Sometimes they focus more on the individual. But be very, very careful of, of in this sort of Western way. We, we always want to dissect the scriptures and be like, well, this part is this. And, you know, Eastern biblical mindset doesn't really have these neat categories that we always like things. So it says, um, they are four kings who will arise from the earth. Again, as we discussed in the first session, um, they are four kings that arise from the earth. It doesn't have to be past tense, future tense. They are four kings who have arisen from the earth. Um, you know, it really, again, could be uh, translated any one of these uh, ways. Again, this is Aramaic, but still it's the perfect tense. It says, now get this, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages. We're going to come back to that. Verse 19, then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. So now he really zeroes in on the last of the beasts, the worst one of all, which was different from all the others. It was exceedingly dreadful with its iron teeth, claws of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It devours with its teeth, and then just whatever is left, it tramples it with its bronze claws. And I also wanted to know about the ten horns. It had ten horns. What are they all about? But specifically, the other horn which came up before which three others fell. The horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts. Again, the Antichrist, which was larger in appearance than its associates. So it starts small, but it ends up becoming bigger than all of the other horns. I kept looking. So it's interesting because he goes, I want to know. But now he's actually looking at the vision and the vision expands. I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Overpowering them. Impossible. I declared Psalm 91 over my life. It says here that the, the Antichrist was prevailing against the saints. We're going to come back to that. Verse 21 through 24. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. The time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. The day of the Lord had arrived. Thus he said, the interpreter, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth. Now, again, we need to recognize in times like this, when it says the whole earth, in Hebrew, in Greek, in English, um, there's a range of meanings, um, you know, throughout the scriptures. In those days, as it says in the Gospels, a decree went out. In the, in the uh, time of Caesar Augustus, a decree went out that all the world should be taken a census. Was it the, did, they, did they go to the Ming Dynasty? Did they go to China? Did they go to uh, Canada? Did they go to South America and take a census? No, it was the Roman Empire. But it calls it all the world. Um, there's multiple times like this. And so you have to understand, it's going to devour, you could say, the whole land, the whole region. It doesn't necessarily mean the entire earth. It doesn't have to. It could. But we need to be very careful of assuming that because there's numerous other passages where it uses identical language and it actually means a massive area, but regional, primarily pertaining to the region that surrounds Israel. Overwhelmingly, that's usually the regions that it's pointing to. Um, it will tread it down and crush it. I personally believe this is referring to the whole region of the Middle East. It's not necessarily going to tread down the entire globe. I don't believe that. 
I believe that there are scriptures that indicate that won't be the case. I do believe the Antichrist will have massive reach, impact, and control. His, his fingers, his tentacles will expand, his reach will um, reach to the ends of the earth. But ultimately, the kingdom is consistently, repeatedly referred to as comprised of ten nations. And overwhelmingly, when they are named, they are Middle Eastern nations. And then he says, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, again, so the fourth kingdom, ten kings will arise. So there it is. And then another will arise after them. There's the Antichrist. He will be different from previous ones, and he will subdue three kings. It repeatedly makes that statement. He's going to initially subdue three, and then after the three, all ten come under his control. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand. The saints will be given into his hand. That's impossible. Again, I declare Psalm 91 over my life and the life of my family. The Lord will give the saints of the highest one into the hand of the little horn of the Antichrist. For a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven. That's the whole earth. Clearly, that's, you know, that type of language will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And then finally, it ends verse 28. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming, and my face grew pale, and I kept the matter to myself. I want to begin with this last verse. Daniel was, at this point, toward the end of his life. He had had many revelations. He had many experiences. This deeply, deeply disturbed him. The things that he saw here deeply alarmed him. His face grew pale. We need to, if we don't understand the gravity of what is being said here, we don't understand the revelation. If we think, oh, nothing to worry about, you know, we're going to be raptured and we don't, this has nothing. There is something horrible that alarmed Daniel, uh, an experienced, seasoned prophet of God. It alarmed him greatly, and we're going to talk about that. So let's begin with this. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth which will be different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, tread it down, and crush it. Now again, as we talked about in the first study, Daniel 7, the four beasts, is a reiteration, a repeat using different imagery of Daniel chapter 2. Okay, so the four beasts represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then as we showed it has to be the Islam, the historical Islamic empire, out of which comes the final manifestation, which is the final revived Islamic empire of the Antichrist. Again, many people believe it's the Roman empire. That's fine. We need to be paying attention. We need to be have watchmen watching east, some go looking west, paying attention. Let's be watchmen on the wall. I personally don't believe the Roman empire meets the scriptural criteria of Daniel 2 verse 40, which says that when the beast rises, it will crush Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. It will crush all the others. The Roman Empire didn't do that. As well as concerning its fall, Daniel 2, 34 and 35, that when the messianic kingdom comes, when Jesus returns and crushes the feet of iron and clay, which correlates to the ten horns that come up out of the beast, uh, verse 27, right, the, the ten horns come up out of the beast. That's the final manifestation of this fourth historical empire, again, the Islamic empire. Um, when the kingdom of Messiah comes and crushes that final antichrist empire, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the, uh, all of the above, are all the gold, are all broken at the same time. The, the, um, the iron, the clay... The clay, the iron, the bronze, the silver, the gold. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Islamic Empire are all destroyed at the same time. Again, if the Roman Empire were fully revived and destroyed, much of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece would be left untouched. Untouched. That is why, again, just in terms of mere geography, I believe this fourth beast would be the historical caliphate comprised of radical nations that take on uh, particularly radical 
um, form of Islam. And some people say there is no such thing as radical Islam. Look, guys, there are plenty of Muslims that are very moderate, peaceful people. And they go, well, that's not true Islam. Whatever. It's not for us to argue about what true Islam is. That's, it's really not for Christians to argue. That's like a Muslim trying to tell a Christian what Christianity is by pointing to some particular Christian preacher and saying, that represents real Christianity. Let's not do that. Let, let Muslims argue about what Islam is. But let's recognize that there are many Muslims that will not participate in this. They have no interest in participating in this. Just like today, there's many, 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 many Muslims that hate ISIS with a passion. But yet there are many that want to sign up and join. So it's really not just an issue of is it Islam, is it this, is it that. It's where is the human heart and those that allow their hearts to be vessels of hatred. And even Christians will allow their hearts to grow cold, as Jesus says. We, it, we Don't think of it as teams. Don't think of it as, well, I'm on the right team. No, pay attention to our hearts. We need to pay attention to our hearts. Where are our hearts? Do we love people or are we just primarily focused on self-preservation. When we focus on self-preservation, that's when it becomes real easy to become overly defensive, to join teams, and then just ultimately want to kill the other team. And I see it from the mouths of professing Christians all the time. And it's appalling. As for the ten horns, again, the final Antichrist empire, out of his kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after him. He will be different from the previous ones, and he will subdue three kings. Now, what is that referring to? What are the three kingdoms? Because here we have something that we can watch for. At the rise of the Antichrist, we can pay attention and go, okay, that's what the scriptures say. I believe this is referring to a passage that... Um, that Dalton will talk about later when we get to Daniel chapter 11. Um, he will also talk about the Antichrist, the King of the North. He will enter the beautiful land. This is uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, beginning in verse 41 to 43. Many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost sons of Ammon. There's an example of a nation, probably Jordan, because that's what Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon are referring to that will not fall to the Antichrist. It seems to say that Jordan will be delivered out of his hand. Okay, so there again, it's not completely global. Some nations, at, even in the region right next to Israel, escape. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold, silver, and all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and Cush will follow at his heels. Libya and Sudan. So here's three kingdoms mentioned specifically, three nations. Egypt, Libya, and Cush. Okay, so it talks about the rise of the Antichrist. At first, three will fall. First, Egypt, and then immediately uh, at his heels, Libya and Sudan. Cush, by the way, is south of Egypt. It could be more than Sudan. Some people include Ethiopia. Personally, I believe it's just referring to Sudan. Um, maybe it's more than that. So that, that's something to watch for. That's something that we should be aware of. And I believe that that's, you know, Daniel is just reiterating the same point here later in chapter 11. Now, it refers to the saints of the highest one. Who are the saints of the highest one? Because this is what's so fascinating is Jesus is the highest one. The son of man in Daniel chapter 7, he is the highest one. The ancient of days is called the most high. Depending on your translation, again, they're slightly different phrases um, in the Aramaic, but they essentially mean the same thing. They're terms that can only be used of Yahweh. But it, call, it says the Antichrist will wage war against the saints of the highest one. Now, we acknowledge that the original context, it would be assumed that the saints of the Son of Man would be Israel. And that's true, but it's really difficult to say that Israel should be identified as the saints of Jesus when the overwhelming majority today don't believe in Jesus, right? That's, it's difficult. And this, again, is talking about the end of the age. And so ultimately, there's a mystery here, and this really is the same mystery that pervades Scripture. Who are the people of God? And this is the debate between dispensationalists and progressive dispensationalists and all these different theological camps. And I personally believe in olive tree theology, Romans 11, right? that you have the olive tree of Israel. Through unbelief, many branches, many individuals down through history have been broken off. But by faith and by grace, that we who are of the faith of Abraham, we've been grafted in. 
and thus we are we have connection to the rich root of Messiah and in this mysterious way we are now identifying with Israel we are de- identifying with Israel now here's the thing we don't replace Israel we've been grafted in if we're Gentiles we've been grafted in but what have we been grafted into what have we been grafted into well again let's just read it and this is this is the culmination I kept looking, and the horn was waging war with the saints, who? Of the highest one, of the most high, the saints of Jesus. The Antichrist was waging war with the saints of Jesus. Now, we know he's going to invade Israel, but here it really seems to be indicating that he's waging war against Christians and overpowering them. Who's winning? The Antichrist is going to win for a short time time and that is the doing of the lord i've been talking a lot about a theology of suffering and how the church today especially much of the charismatic church because they're trying to create which i support they want to see healings and they're trying to create a theology that supports healings and they want to create an atmosphere of faith but as a result we often have a very shallow theology of the cross and an understanding that god at times allows satan to win He allows tragedy in our lives, and in the last days, he will allow the Antichrist to overpower the saints of Jesus for a short time. Now, again, if you hold to the pre-tribulational rapture, you'll say, well, those are the tribulation saints. And I go, wait a minute. Jesus died on the cross to save us from the wrath of God. It doesn't matter when you get saved. It's not like you're saved from the wrath of God if you get saved within this particular time frame. But if you get saved after this date, you are subject to the wrath of God. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. That is an inconsistent theology. Here it says that the Antichrist will be given power to overpower the saints of Jesus. And then in verse 25, he will speak out against the Most High and he will will wear down the saints of the highest one. He will wear us down. The time is coming. And when does it say that we will be given relief, right? Paul says it in uh, 2 Thessalonians. He says, we will be given relief when Jesus is revealed from heaven in in flaming fire, right? That's when we'll be given relief, when he returns in in blazing fire. And again, there's a bit of a bit of a confusion there between the pre-wrath camp and the post-trib camp. you know, we won't get into that right now. But the point is, the scriptures are clear that the saints of Jesus will be subject to being crushed. Now listen, I'm going to end it here because I'm coming up on uh, the end of our time. There is a mystery, and I should probably just park here. There is a mystery of the cross that so much of the church still does not understand. When Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be crucified, Peter said, not so! And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't know the spirit that you're of. He actually called Peter Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Today, when we talk about the fact that in the last days, the Lord will give his people, he will give his body over to be crucified, so many voices will rise up. Not so. The Lord would never do that to his bride. But the tribulation saints, they're going to get crucified. Serves them right for not getting saved after the certain date. That doesn't make any sense to me. There is a wisdom of the cross that we need to understand if we are going to not be offended when the Lord allows us, if we are alive at that time, to be turned over for a short time to the power of the Antichrist. Because in the same way that Jesus died on the cross, demonstrating the mercy of God to the world, Listen, please hear me, friends. The Lord is going to allow his people one brief, short period, moment in history, just before his return, a final glorious opportunity to witness to the enemies of God the mercy of God. When we lay down our lives, we are being what? Martyrs. What does the word martyr mean? It's translated in the New Testament as witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. You shall be my martyrs. The ultimate expression of being a witness to God is when we lay down our lives. Guys, one life. That's all we get. In this age, one life. The only life we're ever going to have, we lay it down. We lay it down. We say, why? Because I fully believe 
that he will raise me up on that day. And I'm laying it down because I want you to see that God loves you too. The mercy of God is extended to you. And that, and that I am imitating Jesus in laying down my life in order that you have an opportunity to repent. And that's being a witness. It's, it's bearing witness concerning this incredible reality, the resurrection. The day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. The Lord will allow his body, his church, his people, as we identify with Israel, Satan will be enraged, as it says in Revelation 12. Satan, the, the, uh, the dragon, goes after the woman Israel. She's given the wings of an eagle. She get, she's given a place in the desert to, to find refuge. And then Satan goes after her other children, those who bear the testimony of Jesus. And how do we ultimately overcome him? By the, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and we don't love our lives unto death. The scriptures are filled with this um, in the context, the time period of the day of the Lord, the last days, the return of Jesus. And guys, we need to get it. We need to get it. If you're a pre-trib and this is offensive, listen, if you want to hope for the best, wonderful, fine, but my goodness, be prepared for the worst. There are more Christians being martyred all around the earth right now than at any time in history. And we are not exempt simply because we live in some Western country. We are not special. We are not privileged any more than our brothers and sisters in Nigeria or Syria or Afghanistan or wherever, right? We are all called to be his witnesses. We are all ultimately called to be his martyrs, to bear witness concerning the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, and the establishment of the kingdom of the Son of Man. All right, amen and amen. That's it for this week, guys. We'll see you in the next session. Maranatha.